welcome everyone. Uh, we'll just um, get everyone in first and, and make sure it's all working. Please um, keep your uh, cameras off and on mute, please, just so that um, we don't have any bandwidth issues. And we'll get going. Um, so um, let's um, let's get going. Uh, so I want to um, just, yeah, as we always do, uh, start out by thanking everyone for being here. Thank you to our uh, presenters. Uh, we've got Roger Hawley. Say hello, Roger. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself there. Hello, everyone. That's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll go through and do a quick introduction before you. Um, who's, who shared their screen there? I think it's Pat. Is Pat a, a uh, an attendee? Yeah. So I just um stop stop just yeah don't show your screen on that please. Um just we'll keep it. We'll we'll share our screens. So um thank you for coming. It's um Thursday the sixteenth of July uh twenty twenty at about midday. So um thank you everyone for being on on here. Um so Roger, um welcome Jackie. Say hello please. Hi everybody. Craig, say hello. Hi everyone. And Ash, say hello. Hey. So um, we're just going to go through um, as we've done in the previous sessions and hear from our four panellists. Uh, as always, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions at the end. You can either put them in the chat uh, if you've used uh, uh, Zoom before, the chat's down the bottom. Uh, in the, you might need to um, just go down to it to, to see it. Um, you can ask questions there. You can send specific messages. If you do have a question, please just either direct the question to myself or put it in the, the chat to everyone, because uh, I'll go through and, and just um, ask those questions of the relevant uh, panelists as we're going. Uh, as always with these, please take the time, um, you know, really to be engaged in these calls. Uh, we've put a, quite a bit of effort into, into this, uh, you know, turn your, your notifications off, turn your email off, turn, off, turn, off, turn all that stuff off so that you can really focus on the next hour and um, keep, keep yourself on, on mute and um, really, you know, focus on what we've got to say and ask any questions. And, you know, as we're going, if, if there's any questions that we can't answer, we'll come back and answer them in the next couple of days. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Roger. Uh, mate, if you want to go forward and, and everyone everyone else, if you can just, um, like all the panellists, um, mute yourself and um, kill the video so that we don't have any bandwidth issues for anyone. And Roger, if you want to um, start up. Sure thing. Thanks, Jeremy. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Roger Hawley, I'm a, an accountant uh, based here in Aspley. And I was hoping to uh, just give a brief update on what's been happening in the tax side, I guess, of what's been going on with coronavirus over the last uh, three months. So I've only got a couple of slides today, but there's a fair bit to talk about on, on each slide. Um, so, most of you that have got staff should have received your cash boost, the $10,000 cash boost within the March BAS when you, when you lodged your March BAS. And then there'll be a further $5,000 come through when you lodge your June BAS and then the final $5,000 when, when you lodge your September BAS. So as, you, as people may recall, this was a cash boost incentive uh, brought in by the government to help people pay for their staff. So anyone that had staff and was registered for PAYG withholding, uh, was eligible for uh, this boost. It was at least 10,000 and up to 50,000 based on how much staff you, uh, PAYG withheld from your staff. Um, in around middle of April, might've been even May, uh, the ATO to their wisdom, they decided to create uh, what they called an ATO eligibility tool uh, for this cash boost. And within this tool, they, um, they basically discounted anyone that had started a business um, after the 1st of July 2019, which has caused a lot of problems for, for new business or restructured businesses. Um, so essentially, if you are in that situation, the ATU, you'll ring up and, because if you look at the criteria currently, uh, all, all, it need, all you needed to have was an ABN. You need to be a small business, have an ABN at the 12th of March. Uh, you need to be registered for PAYG and, and then um, you need to be running a business. And then and there was a couple of others which are just integrity measures, but they were the main six measures, that you, the main four measures that you need to uh, uh, 
be positive with it in order to be eligible for this cash boost. So when the ATO, when they made this eligibility tool, for whatever reason, they, they stopped everyone that was, was a new business. Um, so I've been working with a lot of my clients who were initially deemed ineligible. Uh, you can see that there's a web address there, the cash flow boost review at ato.gov.au. So if you've found, if you are a new business or for whatever reason uh, you've found that they have deemed you ineligible, uh, then you can send off uh, an email to this address and, and have your situation reviewed. And so the other scenario where a lot of my clients have been deemed ineligible is where you've just got a mum and dad and no actual uh, staff outside mum and dad, and they pay themselves director's fees. But because single touch payroll didn't, doesn't come in for associated entities until the 1st of July 2021, you're not actually required to be registered for PAYGW even now. So this tool automatically uh, disallows those type of people as well. So what you need to do before the 31st of July 2020 in order to get the $10,000 for March is send an email to this, this email here explaining your situation. Uh, you'd need to include last year's tax return showing that you have actually taken director's fees out of, uh, out of your company and then also show a bank account transactions where you've transferred money from your uh, bank account, from the company bank account to yourself as director's wages. It's not a fast process. Um, it can take, so far it's taking around two months for each case. Um, but thankfully my success rate with my clients so far is 100% uh, that, that have initially been deemed ineligible by the ATO using their ATO eligibility tool. But once we go through and have it reviewed by the, by the ATO internally, uh, everyone's come out as being uh, eligible. Because it clearly says on the ATO website that directors' fees are eligible for the cash boost. So I might click over to the next one. So we'll just talk about, so the, the two main incentives that are there at the moment is, is the cash boost and then the second one is JobKeeper. Um, I'm not sure of the percentage of businesses that are currently receiving JobKeeper, but it's very, very high. And um, it, it should be, it, I'll just run through a couple of, frequent questions that I get from my clients regularly. So it just, just for an understanding with JobKeeper, the date that they pay you is very arbitrary. Um, it seems to be getting later and later every month. Um, so if the ATO hasn't paid you yet, um, the best thing to do is check with your accountant and make sure that your previous month's sales have been declared. And if they have been declared, then it's just a waiting game because uh, your accountant won't actually know what date you, you're going to be paid. Only, I don't think even the ATO know that. I think it's a bit of a rule at wheel in when they, when they actually send out the payments. Um, I, guess, I guess this slide is more, of a, more than an update. It's more of a, a warning slide for people because what I, what I have noticed is some people are trying to claim JobKeeper twice which will get you in trouble. Um, I've actually had one client that, that uh, you know, fell foul of this. So they, they claim JobKeeper as a sole trader through their own business. And then they also claim JobKeeper as an employee. So if you are in that scenario, uh, then unfortunately you will get caught sooner rather than later. So it's best to be proactive and contact the ATO and, and, and uh, say you've been receiving JobKeeper twice and um, yeah, unfortunately you'll have to return uh, the double payment. Um, as it currently stands, JobKeeper appears to be going ahead until the end of September. Uh, so that'll mean that you'll need to continue uh, giving your, uh, lodging your, the, the previous month's sales, the, the first week or the second week of the, the next month. Uh, the earlier, it appears the earlier people lodge that or declare that the earlier they're getting paid. So. Um, contact your accountant and, and let him know the sales in the in the first week of the following month to get paid uh, for the previous month because it continues to be a month in arrears. And uh, at this stage, it's going to September. 
So that means the final payment will be in October. Um, so I might, I'll just throw you back to you, Jeremy. Has there been any questions in regards to cash boost or JobKeeper that uh, any of the audience need answered? Not, not as yet. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll uh, if you want to stop showing your screen, um, if anyone's got any questions on the cash boost or JobKeeper, then please place them in the chat. Uh, and there'll be the opportunity at the end to talk. Um, Nick, if you could just um, turn your video off, just try and keep video off for um, for um, bandwidth issues for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, if you've got any questions on any of that stuff or anything else for Roger, put that in the chat. And after we've heard all the speakers, we'll, we'll go through and do a Q&A session. So thank you, Roger. Thank you. Uh, that was a good update. Uh, Jackie, do you want to um, unmute and turn your video off? Or turn your video on, actually. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, share, share your your um your update. Okay, great. So in the HR space, wow, it's been a lot of change. Um, while some businesses are in just sorry, working from my home, my dog has decided it wants to get out. Um, if you can hear the dog whining, um, uh, some industries have ramped up. Uh, people would have heard about that. Um, and some uh, employee workloads have increased, others have decreased significantly, some completely stopped, you know, no hours are available in the business. Um, some businesses have had people obviously sharing, uh, sorry, Jeremy, do you mind um, going to the next speaker? I'm going to have to put the dog out. Sorry. Yes, the, the joys of working from home. No problems. Um, <laughs> Jackie, you can put the dog, uh, the dog okay, out. And um, Craig, <laughs> you mind um, coming up now, please? <laughs> and um, talking about what you're going to talk about. Indeed. I can do you that. You don't have any pets up there, do you? Uh, no. no. All right. In the office. Uh, cool. All right. Thanks, uh, Jeremy. Uh, so as Jeremy said, my name is Craig Mason. I'm from SMS Law, uh, one of the legal practice directors there. I just wanted to go through today just sort of the current state of play of what we're seeing uh, from a legal uh, advice point of view and just some things that you need to be doing and pre uh, consider doing over the next period of time just to protect yourself as much as possible from a, a legal point of view. Uh, so in terms of the current state of play, biggest one at the moment is uh, still the commercial leases. So that was something we spoke about at the previous uh, webinar, the changes that were made uh, in Queensland, um, all the temporary changes uh, in regards to commercial tenancies uh, with uh, rent in particular, uh, with the uh, reduction in rent uh, for a period of time and also the deferral of rent for the balance of the lease. Uh, so at the moment we're seeing the quickest results are uh, where the tenants are approaching the landlords with a proposal and a plan uh, for the reduction in rent and then working out what the deferral amount is going to be over the term of the lease. In order to do that, the tenant should put together all their financial information that, uh, as per the, the legislation uh, to provide and remembering that all of the information is all tied back to the JobKeeper test. So that's the downturn of 30% from uh, March last year. Uh, put all that together and then uh, send it over to the landlord or through the agent, depending on uh, what you're doing. Uh, and as I said, the quickest results and the best results we've seen are where the tenant sort of is the proactive one rather than leaving it to the landlord. There are obviously some teething issues with the, with the changes uh, as landlords get up, up to date as well. Any change in legislation and actual um, attest to that, uh, you know, landlords are having to adapt quickly as well. Uh, and remembering for any landlords uh, in the webinar that there are land tax uh, rebates available for landlords. And there's also the options uh, for contacting your bank, for instance, and deferring uh, mortgage payments that you may have on a commercial property. Uh, so there's something there for the landlords as well. Uh, if there is a dispute and you as a tenant or a landlord can't um, come to a, a decision with uh, with the tenant or the landlord, then there are dispute management um, uh, mechanisms within the legislation uh, where someone else will make uh, the decision or help you make the decision if you can't resolve it. So as I said, important to get on the front foot and get all that sorted out as quickly as possible. 
uh, then you can start paying the reduced rent amount and agree to what it is going to be deferred. The other thing that started to come back uh, now from a legal point of view is uh, the court system here in Queensland is uh, being reignited again. Uh, so there are movements coming from the courts in particular with bailiffs and enforcing warrants. Uh, they were on a embargo and were unable to do anything uh, until sort of towards the end of June. Now they're able to again. Uh, so if you are, um, uh, you know, got some debts that uh, are outstanding to your business, then and you have instituted proceedings or want to institute proceedings, uh, those things can now start happening again. There are still the restrictions on the bankruptcy proceedings and the winding up of uh, companies' proceedings with the changes from uh, two or five thousand up to twenty thousand, and in the six months, I think that it, that goes until September from memory. So that's still in in place. So if you're taking any of those actions or if uh, someone is looking at taking those actions against you, just bear in mind that it's now six months and the, the higher threshold. So that the whole purpose of that is to reduce the amount of bankruptcies and liquidated companies during this time uh, and sort of prolong it out for six months. And then in six months time, then uh, yeah, we're not sure what's gonna happen then, but uh, I guess it's watch this space and make sure you're up to date with all the, all the changes. And the other thing that we've been uh, seeing is, and uh, Ashley will again talk about this uh, in his section, is about the increase in uh, sort of activity in the property sector, a uh, number of transactions we've seen coming through uh, for selling, uh, buying, both residential, commercial, uh, new leases, selling businesses, those sorts of things. So it's starting to pick up and there's a lot more activity out there. I think um, we're all sort of, as the, uh, you know, when it sort of happened back in March and April, everyone was sort of sitting back and waiting and now things are starting to happen. So, um, you know, it's, there's definitely some calmness uh, coming back into those sorts of sections. So uh, there, that's basically the current state of play from a, from a legal point of view of what we're seeing. And just uh, wanted to touch on as a business owner, what you need to consider um, to protect yourself legally at this time. As I've said, and, and Jackie said already uh, about um, documenting everything. So if you've got any, if you're making negotiating changes in your lease, for instance, as always document the changes where possible, where that's through an amendment to a lease or in some form of um, written trail of emails or whatever it might be, uh, to ensure you've got that in writing. If there are telephone calls going back and forth, uh, say uh, then, I would always uh, recommend that after a telephone call, you send an email saying, thank you, Bob, uh, as agreed on the telephone call, uh, rent's gonna be this, X, Y, Z, whatever it might be, and just document exactly what that is in a timely fashion after a telephone call. There is still time at the moment to negotiate with suppliers if you need to. Uh, again, we found upfront approaches uh, or payment arrangements um, are still agreeable to suppliers provided they, you know, they're reasonable obviously, and they are supported by some form of financials. Again, if you are renegotiating or changing supply terms or credit terms, again, make sure you document that uh, as much as possible. And obviously, you know, this is gonna continue for some time. We don't know how long uh, there's gonna be restrictions and lockdowns and those sorts of things. And it may have changed the way that we do business um, forever. It's important obviously to keep on keep on top of all the changes and seek the advice along the way. So it's more important than ever to have your team of advisors uh, with you along this uh, journey uh, so they can uh, give you the advice and the sorts of people that you need are the sorts of people that are on this uh, webinar, your accountant, HR, uh, property specialist, uh, lawyer, those sort of people. Make sure you're seeking that advice along the way because there are changes happening uh, regularly and you need to be on top of that to help uh, you know, protect your business going forward. So they were the three sort of topics I wanted to touch on, Jeremy, unless there's any questions. And Jackie's dog is uh, calm. <laughs> I think Jackie's uh, back. Back to Jackie. Jackie. I'm back. <laughs> thank, well, thank you, Craig. Um, I do have some questions, but I'll, I'll, um, we'll, we'll have a chat about them afterwards. Yeah, Jackie, is your dog calm now? Calm yeah. and contagious? <laughs> Okay, yes, calm is <laughs> contagious. Let's hope it continues that way. 
So right. let's get back to the HR space. Uh, I want to take a quick look at the major changes that took place through COVID-19 in the HR arena and then provide my advice on what employers should really be considering doing now and over the coming months uh, amongst the million other priorities um, that I'm sure everyone has. So um, when it all started, uh, the reduction in custom, you know, whether it's customers, patients, clients, hit everyone pretty hard. This meant businesses had to recalibrate and really look at, to go back to the workforce planning drawing board in many ways and try to right size the business when we still didn't really know what, what was ahead and what the right size even was. Um, while the Fair Work Act wasn't set up ever written for something like a pandemic, uh, we, we still had to make decisions and advise business owners based on, on the fair work framework that we had. Um, it was so frustrating for so many uh, business owners that we're working with and for us, but uh, trying to navigate through at that time and make sure that we didn't put a foot wrong. So um, if you are on that point, if anyone listening is a little concerned that they may have put a foot wrong there, um, make sure you contact um, whether it's uh, probably if uh, it's around fair work and the legal side of things, contacting uh, Stretton Mason lawyers, Jeremy and Craig, um, if not myself, uh, to yeah look at the situation there and what level of exposure you might have. Um, but back then it was around stand downs. Can we stand down our staff? Can we not? Uh, redundancies, we were varying uh, people's contracts and really transitioning people to work from home. They were the main things we were all doing. And then JobKeeper was announced, which was great. It was such a relief for those that were eligible, but it did come with a lot of confusion around whether employers could pay, uh, had to pay out of their own pockets up front, or uh, they could just back pay employees once it, once it came uh, through from the government. So there was a lot of moral issues and ethical issues there that, was, um, that made it extra tough. Um, the amendments came through with awards and the Fair Work Act, which was great, uh, started making things a lot more flexible for employers around leave conditions and hours of work, things like that. And once those things were getting better down, it started to become clear uh, that well-being, uh, the well-being area of HR was uh, a needed to be a focus. Um, and all that disruption um, and change was really taking its toll on our people. And that continues now. And I'll, I'll mention that when I speak about where we need to focus at the moment in a minute. So um, it then reached a point in time where businesses needed to focus on reopening and the huge body of work that needed to be completed in the, in the workplace health and safety space of HR. Um, really important to get that right. There was a lot of guidance out there, but also a fair bit of confusion. And it's really important that any changes to um, workplace health and safety and, and employment arrangements of your employees are all documented. As I say, if you're unsure that you've got all that documentation in order, it's better to reach out now. So what's ahead of us and, and what can we do, um, what can you and I do as employers, owners, business owners, managers, uh, to really take charge of the change from here moving forward. So as Roger said, the big cliff that's looming is at the end of September when JobKeeper ends and between now and then, it's gonna be a pretty stressful time for many, especially those businesses where custom hasn't return significantly and there's still a lot of uncertainty about how things will even look come September, let alone now. So if that's you and your business, then the implications of this, you're possibly going to mean, it's possibly going to mean another round of um, possibly redundancies, but really going back to that workforce planning drawing board again and recalibrating your workforce. Um, really at this stage, knowing what all your options are. And as I say, it could be round redundancies, it could be uh, continued variations to your contracts for reduced hours, it could be uh, renegotiating contracts, people taking leave. I mean, nobody wants to put off any staff, obviously, but at the end of the day, you do need to do what's required to keep your business afloat and solvent. So um, interestingly, the latest Pulse survey by ARI, which is the Australian Human Resources Institute. That's our 
peak body for HR in Australia. Their survey, they've been doing lots of surveys, but one in June that they um, they gave us a um, some data on recently was that nearly 50% of organisations um, feel that they're going to make permanent changes to their business as a result of the pandemic. So um, it was it was nearly 50%. It was something like 47, 48% or something, which was pretty huge. So the new new normal is definitely real. Uh, another interesting thing we're seeing is that many employees are saying they have little desire to flip back to the way we we're all working pre-COVID and they'd prefer to keep working from home. They don't actually want to come back into the office uh, for very varying reasons. Some feel they're much more productive without you know, having to spend that time doing the commute. Um, they feel that there's a lot of wasted time around the office um, and they find it easier to focus. Uh, but then there's others who prefer to be back in the office for various reasons. I mean, we're all, we're all human. We all differ in so many ways. So um, this variation in views isn't really so surprising. Um, that's why the key here really is for business owners, employers to communicate with your team members, um, looking at where flexibility uh, can possibly be entertained and whether employees working from home uh, remotely uh, is actually a better way forward. Um, some businesses have really looked at it carefully and are accepting that it definitely is and adopting that new normal now. Um, so take a look at, at how you have or how you can build in some structure around communication to and from your employee base because communication, it, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, especially in more turbulent economic times like this, um, the less likely staff are to speak up out of fear that whether their job is even secure. So it's really important to give those employees a voice and consider ways that you can do that, whether it's regular or more formal or less formal one-on-one -on -one check ins well-being check-ins a lot of people are doing um, it could be surveys or team meetings but giving your people a voice will have uh, benefits and including things like improved performance stronger engagement levels less in absenteeism and um, hopefully uh, it will um, hopefully it will result for you in higher retention rates so um, one very obvious key to surviving moving forward is automating as much as possible in your business. Um, and that's not just in the HR space, but when it comes to HR, there are a lot of transactional HR tasks that definitely can be automated by utilizing a HR platform. So I definitely recommend business owners look into what HR platforms might be right for your business and uh, automate as much as you can on the biz in the business and save a whole heap of time and money there. Um, from all predictions, the uh, amount of change is likely to continue. As Craig said, for some time makes it really important to create as much structure and order around your HR processes as you can. Uh, this is going to create a lot more clarity for you and, and that sense of certainty and confidence that your business is in uh, a much better shape to withstand the ups and downs ahead. So when I say it's important to create structure and order across your HR processes, I'm talking here about the core HR processes um, most importantly. Um, the, the HR functions that have the greatest impact on your people and your bottom line. And those, those are the functions that in HR that your HR strategy has got to be focused on right now. If it hasn't been already, you've got to get those right now um, before focusing on all the other nice to haves in the HR area. So um, I just whiz through what I feel those five are that you really should be focused on now. First one is recruitment. I mean, if we're going to recruit new team members, you need to have really robust, well-designed and really predictable recruitment processes. Uh, you don't want recruitment processes that are going to be wasting time and resources. Uh, you want to make sure the selection tools that you're using in your recruitment processes really do add value to the process. 
in terms of helping you separate that um, the best fit candidates from from the rest of the applicants. So there's lots of different types of selection tools out there that they really need to be targeted at the capabilities um, and the skills that you uh, or personal qualities that you need uh, right now and moving forward. And as far as those qualities, um, don't underestimate the the uh, importance of um, using quality, recruiting based on qualities like resilience, flexibility, agility, because even if the new starter won't be experiencing a lot of change in their own role, they're going to be surrounded by change in their private life and in the workplace. So um, bringing on people at the moment who really, and, and developing in your existing people, uh, those qualities around resilience is uh, something I definitely recommend. The second HR function to get right now is around onboarding. Now, onboarding is a bit of a HR speak um, term, but it's really around um, that those early weeks and months and ramping up those new starters to full proficiency as quickly as possible. And there are numerous initiatives that you can build into your onboarding processes for those new starters. Um, think about what will assist them on that early journey of, of experiences that they're going to have in settling into their role. Uh, but it's not just their role, look at how they're settling into their team, the, their physical workspace um, and the organisation as, as a whole. So um, the third one is... Um, getting focused on how you're managing employee well-being at the moment because with so much change and disruption, uh, fostering well-being really does need to main, uh, remain a constant priority. Uh, it's a slippery slope if you um, are losing, if you're, if you're not focused on this at the moment. Um, processes, initiatives that you can build in, uh, make sure that they're ones that uh, are going to support and guide the and educate your team members around physical well-being and make sure that they're actually um, processes or practices or initiatives that the employees are actually going to value um, and are going to bring about the outcomes that um, around retention, performance, um, increasing commitment and loyalty and things like that at this time. Make sure that you're not um, wasting your time on initiatives. You know, it's not about, um, or in most businesses, it's not necessarily about getting the ping pong table and, and the slide in the business. Uh, it runs a lot deeper and, and things around financial well-being, um, mental health, uh, emotional well-being, physical well-being, obviously, um, and nutrition, things like that. So um, the fourth HR function that I think it's really essential to focus on right now um, is measuring employee engagement. Now, this is um, actually about bringing, so I'm talking about communicating to your employees, but now I'm talking about getting the communication back from the employees. It has to, you have to keep your finger on the pulse at the moment with all this change as to how your employees are thinking and feeling about working for you at the moment and working in the business and with their, with their team. Um, otherwise, we really are foregoing that opportunity to influence how, they, how long they're going to stay. Um, we forego the opportunity to influence what, what they're going to, what they say to others about working with you, um, how they're going to behave and conduct themselves when they're at work. So initiatives like running regular engagement surveys possibly uh, can be really powerful at a time like this. And you can do those anonymously um, too, so that for employees feel comfortable answering honest, maybe more honestly, um, because they know their answers can't be identified as, as coming from them. And just finally, the fifth one, uh, compliance. Um, compliance should always be the basis of any HR strategy anytime but really crucially right now. When it comes to HR compliance, I'm talking about the Fair Work Act and all your awards and enterprise agreements, that sort of stuff. Um, and the second area is workplace health and safety. So that's the Act, codes of practice that, that relate to the type of work that's conducted in, in your business. So um, there's also in the safety space, obviously the government requirements around safety at the moment. 
for example, social distancing, all the cleaning and disinfecting and all that sort of stuff. So it's really critical that you have clarity around whether your HR practices are or are not compliant with all your employer obligations because the buck will stop with you essentially and um, the financial penalties as I'm sure Craig and Jeremy will let you know are pretty damn huge and it won't matter how amazing your recruitment processes or your onboarding uh, processes or your uh, communication skills are um, if you're found non-compliant um, all that could possibly um, come crashing down and you could lose it all. The very final point I want to make um, is around what the Fair Work Ombudsman has announced recently they're going to focus on over the next 12 months. I think this is critical for everyone to know. Um, they're going to continue to provide education and advice and uh, tools and resources to businesses, especially those hardest hit by COVID-19. But um, their compliance and enforcement activities are going to be focused apparently on non-compliance with workplace laws across fast food, restaurants, cafes, which has been a focus for a little while now. And they're also announced horticulture and the harvest trail, they call it, franchises and sham contracting. Sham contracting has been out there as a focus of theirs for a for a while too but uh that's for the 2021 um they're going to be they're they're pretty uh busy dealing with non-compliance in the area of the job keeper scheme because there's a form where people can put uh, businesses can put uh claims in that uh, people are their employees aren't following the direction so they're busy with all that and in the corporate sector there's um underpayments of staff have become significant a significant issue of public concern so that's going to continue to be a priority for them in 2021 apparently so um, uh, if you're unclear whether any of your HR processes are set up to help you whether whether the ups and downs moving forward um, then yeah I would take stock of things now and um, start prioritizing how you're going to move and emerge out of COVID-19 and just not underestimating the value that you have in your the people you already have um, if, if you've got people then I on, I might be a bit biased but I reckon your your people are going to be your ticket out of all of this so that's all from me, Jeremy. Thank you, Jackie. That was um, excellent. So as, as I said before, there's been a few people who've joined um, in the last 10 minutes or so. If you've got any questions, please put them in the chat uh, to everyone or to me. Uh, and we'll, um, after we hear from our last speaker, Ash, we'll, um, we'll go and talk and go through the questions. So Ash, do you want to um, share your screen and unmute and all the rest? Yeah, that can do. I'll just bring this up now. So I've prepared this as a bit of a sanity check as much as anything, just on the general property market. I mean, those that have seen the last ones that I've done have been around mostly focused on tenant and owner um, interactions and relationships through this process. And I mean, good news out of that's probably the one takeaway for me out of this whole thing has been the, the collaboration of, of owners and tenants is, has basically been the rule, not the exception. Um, there's been very few um, cases of, either side digging in too hard and having to get um, um, get legal or, or, or combative on that front. Obviously that's all that you would see, but on the at the coalface with most of our tenants, it's um, it's been pretty pretty collaborative, which is good. So what I've got here is this is my dashboard that I keep pretty much for my for myself, but it's it's normally a, a combination of red and green across some um, different areas. But just to give you an insight into so this is a just a general market snapshot, and it's um, it's just purely activity based. So it's not a it's not opinion. It's just I've got I think we've got the largest team across the north side now, feeding all their daily activity into this. So we get to see what's actually happening. You know, so the lease deals for this is June versus May. So one and a half million dollars worth of leases. That was um, double what we had in May. Um, Twelve and a half million in sales. That was up. So inquiry, inspections, offers and deals, they all they all jumped up. But if we dig into a little bit of the specifics on it, you'll see a few interesting things. So this is inquiry by type with um, industrial retail office and tenant and investment. Now through the through the dark days, obviously we saw office and retail fall off a cliff. There was no 
no activity. We saw a spike in industrial compared to them just based on online activity and sur so surplus um, warehousing requirements because of online shopping and extra space required for office where they couldn't work from home for security purposes. They had to take on some um, industrial space that allowed for the social distancing to, to let them operate through there. But come into May and we start to see a re re real recovery of, um, of retail and office, especially on the sunny coast where the retailers were still very online driven, but quickly pivoted on how they actually operated their business to have a more a front of house, back of house scenario rather than just straight, straight shop front. Um, so it's been quite encouraging to see how that how that goes. Um, oh, that's not working. So, sorry. Um, let me kill that for a second. Um, sorry, wrong link. Um, train wreck. Um, uh, sharing back to that one. Be careful where you click. Um, okay, so so this was the retail inquiry um, I was just talking about. We see a real spike through um, through May. Um, if we're getting into the inspections now, that recovered really quickly. So this was people once once the lockdown finished, coming back out. You know, up to 100 a hundred a week of people looking at um, looking at property, and most of this is driven by um, leasing and, and owner occupier. Um, demand where a lot of the investment stock that we've sold that has been sight unseen. Southern buyers buying, basically buying an income of a, of a property. They check out the video, they check out the lease details and, and move on. Um, and the, the fall off we're seeing here is actually a workload issue, not a, a number issue. So this is the one factor where um, I'm reliant on agents specifically entering at the end of the day to say, this is what I've done for the day. I can see their, their calendar and I know the numbers are off because they're run off their feet on support rather than um, than the actual numbers falling down. I've done it again. Well played. One second. Sorry. Okay. Um, so the the offers has been a real interesting thing where it's coming up to um, sixty. So that's twelve people a day willing to. You know, go pen to paper on on property in our um, in our patch, which they're numbers that we've never seen before. Um, even you see um, January is traditionally pretty quiet. February was was a little bit down for us as well compared to last year. But these numbers being you know, averaging fifties and sixties is um, there's some pretty serious offer numbers, and they're turning into mostly you know they, uh, the conversion rate being around thirty um, percent is pretty pretty solid as well. So the, that indicates there's not a massive bottom feeder element to the offers. They're actually genuine um, tenants and owner occupiers coming through to, um, to create activity. Now these are the commercial sales year on year for the whole Ray White group. And we see a real drop off through April, May, as you'd expect, but the recovery on the commercial front is we're back on par for, um, for what it's been over 18 and 19 compared to this year. And the interesting one is actually the residential sales volume um, so this is across the whole AY group. Which... Ash, yep. your microphone has, has dipped down. I'm not sure whether it's the same for everyone else, but I'm not sure where they're using your. Okay. Um, let me check. That's that's a bit better now. That's a bit so... better. All right. I'll just hold it up there for now. Um, so that's, yeah, actual volume of sales is is right up for um, for residential, which is is helping with, um, I'll, I'll touch on it in a second on values. But so these are the, this is probably the counterpoint to the positivity that we're seeing in the day-to-day -day activity at the moment is we're not entirely sure. Yeah, we, we know, when we say we know, I'm comfortable with the trends continuing through till the end of September, but after that, we're going to have some, um, some unknowns, which is JobKeeper finishing, the rent assistance, the mortgage deferrals, no evictions. Um, so there's 43% yeah, of our tenants are relying on some form of incentive at the moment. Um, so what happens when that stops is the, yeah, that's the, the unknown for, for us right now. Um, interesting one we were just talking on is the instant asset write-off was the first incentive scheme to 
come due for expiry and that was June 30 and that's now been extended out to December 31st. That's probably the least impactful for most people and the least expense for the government but it's just an in interesting indication that they're open to um, extending these as, as needed. So it'll be um, interesting to see what happens on that front. So just summing up on a few fronts, the bottom so far was shallower than we expected and the recovery has been a bit quicker for most industries and especially office and retail was really surprising. Um, so Allied Health and um, government is driving some decent activity on the office front. Um, our property management team actually had the largest month ever in June in terms of rent collection, um, which when we were sitting in March obviously wasn't going to be the, the expectation. Um, so there is actually, there are, you know, um, COVID support packages in place for a lot of tenants, but there's still, all the tenants are actually paying rent and there's, there's not a huge um, um, rent arrears issue going on at the moment across the portfolio. Um, so we've only had, I think it was seven businesses close, actually just hand the keys back in and, and say too hard. We, through the, since the start of COVID, which is actually less than what we had in January and February, just through natural attrition. So we're all, you know, businesses always um, come and go and we've actually seen fewer businesses close through this patch, mostly because of the, um, the supports that are in place. Um, values, property values haven't really taken a hit yet and there's no reason why they should between now and um, now and October. And a lot of that is driven on the commercial side, driven by um, combination of owner occupiers and um, passive investors. So funding is tricky, but not as hard as we expected. Um, it's really driven by banks' appetite and being specific on the bank. If you go just, if in a nutshell, using a broker is almost a must do at the moment. Um, there's some interesting stats around, like if you're a new client of Westpac, there's only one person in Westpac that can sign off on a new client and um, there's a four month wait for that to happen. So they've just basically put a lockdown on new business, whereas other banks are really aggressive at, at trying to capitalize on this this period. So um, getting onto a, the right broker and letting them square peg, square hole your your particular information and not all of your information as well is, is kind of a, um, a trend at the moment. Packaging the right info to the right bank is, is getting some pretty good results. And interesting side effect of JobKeeper is that everyone's financials are actually in place now for the, like the first time. So we've all got our ducks lined up. So there's some, there's quite a few businesses having success with chasing funding for, um, for equipment and, uh, and property purchases because they've done all the heavy lifting to get their, um, get their financials up to speed for JobKeeper. Um, so silver lining on that one. And just in general, Southeast Queensland is benefiting probably the best of any of the majors out of the home builder grant. So because our average house prices or the bulk of our homes are under the 750,000 value, it's um, compared to Sydney and Melbourne where they're not, um, means the, the stimulus package for that has been really well received. I mean, I know I've got four staff that are currently now um, buying their first home um, just in the last two weeks. They've, they've started that process and one's buying his second at you know, age 25. It's a, it's a bizarre pattern of, um, of how quickly that has kicked in, especially up in our little patch here on the Northern Corridor. Um, I know Stockland are fast tracking their um, 2022 supply of land at Aura. Um, and the, I've spoken to two different builders on the coast that have had their biggest months ever in June for sales. So um, some really strong, as far as the Northern Corridor property goes, if you own property in here, residential, commercial, I feel pretty insulated with what's, you know, compared to other other patches, we we know we've got the um, decent growth coming through. Infrastructure spend has been fast tracked on a few key things that will keep prompting um, prompting growth, and the incentive for that home builder is really working well for us. Um, counterpoint to that on in terms of calm is contagious. An interesting thing I saw. It was about two weeks ago. Some of you might have seen the article, but I was approached by um, a one of the local newspapers to because they know we keep the stats on all the all the activity, um, and I showed, gave them all the 
the same kind of information I'm giving you here that um, through COVID, um, about 30% of the businesses were went into forced closure um, through legislation, um, but they've all opened back up. Everything's going well. Got the article through the day after, and it, the headline read: um, "Local expert expert predicts one in three businesses to close due to COVID." So that was the the sensationalist take on um, on some pretty decent numbers that are that are happening across the across the area. So um, yeah, I found it both infuriating and slightly amusing. So but that's all for me on on that front for now, Jeremy. Thank you for that, Ash. Um, all right, so um, I've just had to switch devices, so that's why if I look differently, um, uh, that, that's why that's the case. So um, if you've got any questions, if people can put that into the chat. Uh, Craig, there was a question that I sent to you. Do you want to unmute yourself and go to that question, please? Yeah. Um, Your camera's um, off. Yeah, no, but it's, oh. it is on, but now it's on. Yeah, there you go. Uh, question was, I'm not sure who it was from, but it's um, just if I could share my thoughts or real world feedback on the implications of reductions in rent for landlords slash tenants with a self-managed super fund and the business owner, i.e. they are related parties. Uh, that is what should self-managed super fund trustees be aware of. Uh, I can touch on that and Roger may have other things to say as well. Uh, my understanding is that um, the ATO have said that if there are reductions in the rent to a related party, that they're not going to see issue with that for last financial year and this financial year, even if it is a related party. And the other thing you need to be aware of, which is what the, the uh, attendees' questions about as well, is just... Um, you know, is it in the best interest of the super fund uh, and the arm's length uh, provisions as well? So it's just important that if you are going to give a rent reduction to a tenant, that you have all the documents that you would normally get if it wasn't a related party. So uh, the financials, etc., and uh, any other information that they can put together. So it's um, seen to be arm's length and you've got all the evidence there. Obviously, when you're talking about the best interest of the, the super fund, uh, for instance, if the tenant can't pay the rent uh, because of the downturn, then getting something, um, even if a reduced amount, is better than better than, than nothing if the business won't survive. So those sorts of things need to be considered when uh, thinking about it from a self-managed super fund point of view that owns property uh, and giving uh, rent reductions. Roger, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, I think you pretty well nailed it. Um, because just because it's an associated party, it doesn't uh, remove any of uh, the responsibilities because it, it, it's an arms link. It, it has to be an arms link transaction, and with a self managed super fund, it is it is audited as such. Uh, so if the rent is excessive or, or not enough, then it won't pass the audit. So it, it I think you can effectively disregard that it's an associated party provided that it's uh, being the transaction is being completed on an arm's length basis then um, then the ATO are comfortable with that generally yeah so I, I think you you've nailed it I've got nothing nothing further to add sir cool all right um I don't see any other questions in the chat um I did have to change devices so if I've lost any questions that someone's put up um if any of the other panelists have got questions in their chats. If not, um, does anyone have any questions? Um, please put them in the chat. Or um, um, So Lewis has got a question for Ash. Um, Ash, um, you mentioned Southern, invest Southern investors buying up properties. I'm curious to know if, if you have um, noticed if any of these are super, super fund trustees. Um, is there more, any more or less interest from um, self-managed super fund trustees buying property? Um, combination, but yet yeah, there's definitely still um, uh, super fund activity and there's quite a bit of um, activity coming out of the resi market into commercial because the, um, the southern 
kind of volatility in the housing and the, the lower returns. Um, there's a lot of uh, buyers, agent and investor, investment advisors seem to be bringing, um, bringing buyers across from resi into, um, into commercial industrial, uh, especially the, the strata industrial sheds, the sub, probably sub 700,000. Um, so massive demand for, especially sub million dollar properties in general, but there, there is some, um, a decent amount of that is in uh, super fun, super fun activity. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for that, Ash. Um, any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes before our scheduled um, time to finish this talk. Um, if, if you do have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, I'll just give the opportunity for the speakers just to say a final word. Roger, I know you've got to go by one, so um, do you yeah, want to just finish I, off with I anything? I had a uh, question for Jackie, if that's okay. I did ask her off here, but I think it'd be, I think it's a good question to ask her on air, if that's okay, because there might be other listeners there that would be interested. Yeah. Mm. Hello, Jackie. I have a question for you. It's for one of, one of my clients called me yesterday and um, she's currently on JobKeeper for each of her employees who are receiving the JobKeeper allowance. Uh, the employees are full-time and each of them are getting paid over and above the JobKeeper allowance. Um, but unfortunately, she literally has zero work on the horizon and she's looking to either you know put the staff off or ideally what she wants to do is just pay them the job keeper amount and not pay them the amounts uh, the, their full-time amounts that they normally receive could you just give some advice in regards to that scenario uh, for my client please bearing in mind she, she's based in New South Wales if there's if there's anything that's different to Queensland mm, okay Yep, no worries, Roger. Yeah, same situation for a lot of people. Um, the steps she needs to take is uh, due to the Fair Work Act changes where employers are allowed now to uh, issue what they call a job keeper enabling direction, uh, which allows them to reduce the number of hours if they weren't able to already. Because some businesses, remember, they have an enterprise agreement, so not knowing whether this business or uh, does or not. Uh, so they were already allowed to do this. But uh, but yes, uh, issuing a letter essentially advising that um, the hours will be reduced to whatever the minimum might be, or if there's no hours, um, make sure that letter stipulates what the actual reality of the situation is. And um, no, they don't need to perform any hours to get the job keeper payment so the 750 a week will just keep coming through to the employer and they pass it on uh, take the tax out and pass it on to the employee regardless of whether the employee is doing any hours or not if the employee uh, ends up doing some hours this is before september when it all finishes um, does do some hours um, over what would be equivalent you know, calculate to be equivalent of 750 a week, then they do need to be paid for those hours. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. some businesses are having the employee work, uh, calculating out how many hours would uh, be equivalent to $750 a week and just having the employees work those. Um, but if there's no hours, then there's no hours. The yeah, yeah, that's, still unfortunately, that's through. that's the scenario. That, that's excellent. Thank you. One one further question. Let, let's say uh, so job keepers due to run out the end of September, last payment will come in in October. Assume my client's situation, the downturn remains constant and she still has no work for these employees come October. Uh, will, then, will she then be required to go through the redundancy route and, and, and pay out huge redundancies. So unfortunately, she won't be in a financial position to pay out a redundancy. Yeah, um, very, very likely uh, redundancy is going to be the best option for businesses. I'm not sure whether a fair work are going to do anything around, um, you know, the paying out. I'm sure they wouldn't say that we uh, businesses don't have to pay out all those entitlements, but some sort of um, arrangements where maybe they're paid out over over time rather than mm. in that last pay pay run. 
um, yeah, we're, we're just going to have to watch this space at the moment. We don't know what they're going to do. But, yeah, because um, I, I think there'll be quite a few of those come will. up in October yeah. because JobKeeper, from its commencement to its uh, finalisation, will be six months. And during that time, if the business hasn't uh, progressed or it, or it hasn't got back to where it was pre-COVID, it's effectively been existing on JobKeeper payments and also the cash boost payments. So once they run out or, or, or they stop receiving them, then then uh, then these businesses may be forced into liquidation. Yep. If if, if because if they are faced with massive uh, redundancy payouts, then liquidation will be the more likely scenario than than uh, than paying out redundancies, which. Mm. Gee, I hope we can avoid that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry to hear about that client. That's uh, not... No, that's okay. She, she's a fighter. She'll pull through. She's got a good accountant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, that there's going to be a lot more to be said about that towards, you know, September yeah. and October. So I think we'll um, we'll definitely be keeping these these um, sessions going when we, um, once, once we know more and once, you know, yeah, thoughts just... get changed and, and things get amended. Based on what the government has done for us to date, I would find it very unlikely that they'll just leave us in the lurch in October, because otherwise there will be an avalanche of of, of, country, of companies going into administration. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, for good health reasons, they've, they've made they've made these decisions, and they have to make sure that people survive them. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I would have thought that come September we'd be having some, you know, well, probably before that, some changes for businesses that are in that situation, mm. so that they're not they're not hurt as badly. Especially, you know, like we don't know what's happening with Victoria and all the rest of that. So, lots of things, you know, at this stage might change as we go forward. So, it's a watch this space. We'll definitely keep these going and definitely keep people informed as we're as things change and my announcements are made. I think the the federal government's making a, a, a review of JobKeeper available on, in a week's time. So, um, depending on what comes out of that, we might. Have, have another session of this so um please keep that in mind watch out for our emails and our invites and everything so um i don't have any other questions so roger um, anything else you want to add as a, as a close no as very well? much uh, thanks for organizing jeremy good session as always and uh, thanks to everyone for listening excellent jackie no no last words really thank you for listening and uh hopefully if anyone's listening from victoria hang in there <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Craig? Yeah. Uh, ditto everyone else. Thanks for joining us. Uh, parting shot would be just make sure you document everything. It may not seem important right now, uh, but as we were just touching on come October or next year when things uh, might start happening, and if you can refer back to a document, you might be in front. So make sure you document it now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Craig. Ash? Um, yep. Only thing I wanted to throw in the mix was with um, super funds that just touching on that question before, um, if anyone needs, normally you just need an arm length, arm's length appraisal by a um, registered agent. If you need that, we do that for our clients all the time. It's just a um, normally three, three pieces of comparable um, evidence is enough to keep everyone happy. So um, send them through if you need them. Yep, sounds good. All right, well, as, as I said, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. We'll let you know when we do the next one of these and we'll um, push through. And if anything changes, we'll, we'll bring one on urgently. Otherwise, we'll see you on the next one in, in the next couple of weeks. So have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Very good. Thank you. Bye.